four, three, two, and one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Capital Gains Tax Solutions Podcast, where we believe most high net worth individuals and those who help them, they struggle with clarifying their capital gains tax deferral options. Not having a clear plan is the enemy, and using a proven tax deferral strategy, such as the Deferred Sales Trust, is an amazing way for you to exit highly appreciated assets, primary homes, luxury real estate, commercial real estate, cryptocurrency, stocks, so you can defer millions of dollars of capital gains tax, eliminate some estate tax, and so you can preserve and then create more wealth on your terms at your timing. For those who don't know, who don't know me, my name is Brett Swartz, and I'm founder of Capital Gains Tax Solutions. And each episode, I'm joined by some of the best real estate, financial, wealth, and business minds in the world where they share their ideas, deal stories, and inspiration. So together, we can make complex tax deferral strategies simple and passive income plans achievable. We're also streaming on expert CRE secrets as well for all the commercial real estate entrepreneurs, investors, and experts out there. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, I'm excited about our next guest. He's out of the great state of California. Uh, he's a native from California, spent some time in Hawaii, and he's on a mission to help his clients create and preserve more wealth. In fact, he advises private individuals and families on their personal investment and advanced planning needs. In addition, he oversees um, the firm One Capital Management LLC, Retirement and Corporate Service Practice. Previously, our guest spent four years as an investment advisor with the boutique private wealth management firm in Los Angeles. And uh, Bay, uh, he was also head of corporate service business development for American Financial Network for three years and so much more. Please welcome to the show with me, Brad Barrett. Brad, how are we doing? Good, Brad. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And for our listeners getting to know you for the first time, could you give us a little bit more about your story and your current focus? Yeah. Uh, so as a private wealth manager, I've been doing it uh, coming up on 20 years here. I, I share with people, I never really flipped a burger before. So I've been doing this since I was 16 years old. I uh, had a cathartic event in my life that happened that led me to basically beg a bank to give me a teller job when I was in high school. And um, I went on from there, got my economics degree and started my practice in college. Worked for broker dealer for a couple of years and then joined up with my partners here at One Capital um, about uh, 13, 14 years ago. And we grew the firm from about half a billion dollars or so to about $5 billion today, just serving private wealth um, families across this great nation of ours uh, with niches in sports and entertainment, advanced planning, ultra high net worth individuals, first responders, and across the board. Um, married two kids, live in California, and uh, excited to be here. So thanks again for having me on. Absolutely. We're talking about the psychology of money, everybody, and it's going to be amazing because you've got a lot of a lot of experience, and a lot of expertise, and a lot of passion on Brad's end. And so we'll be digging into the psychology of money in just a minute. But before we go there, Brad, I want to take one other step backwards. You know, I believe you've all been given certain gifts in this life, and these gifts have been given to us to be a blessing and help to others. So once you go back to the younger days, maybe the days that you're surfing in the Malibu waves there in California, uh, you know, what's what's maybe one or two strengths that you believe you were given, and how does that help how you help and bless people today? You know, great question. I, you know, I actually, when I was 16 years old, my dad worked for a company for about 20 years and that company actually gone bankrupt. So it actually affected thousands of people. It was one of the largest corporate bankruptcies in the nation. It was crazy. And I was 16 years old, just trying to understand what was going on. I had two younger sisters and I remember right then and there, you know, in my mind, God touched my heart and said, you know, I, I want you to learn everything you possibly can about money. So in my personal experience, I didn't want that to happen to me ever again. But then more than that, that's where he touched my heart and said, this is what I want you to do for your life. And um, I was I feel like I was gifted with the ability to connect with people, um, really empathize with where they're at. You know, and I obviously coming from a background where I can share with people. I think one of the biggest psychologies that we'll probably talk about today around money in general, whether it's taxes, investments, savings, doesn't matter, is losing it. Right. And so I think I had been there before I'd sat in that seat. And so I wanted to share that with the world and do it through the eyes of a financial advisor. And so I got all my designations, my, my licenses, and um, that's what I felt like he, you know, touched me with then. And that's what I wanted to share with the world. Fantastic. Connecting with people, empathizing and uh, sharing real world examples of, of coming from um, the bottom, right? So yeah. uh, been there for others is sure the key, right? And so by the way, you can learn more about Brad Barrett, who's a certified financial planner by going to his YouTube channel. It's called Make Your Money Matter. At Brad Barrett, it's Make Your Money Matter, and Barrett is spelled B-A-R-R-E-T-T. -T. All right, Brad, let's jump right in uh, to the topic at hand. You know, what, what would you say is the number one secret, Brad, to the psychology of money? You know, so it, it's funny. I actually started talking a lot about this probably ten years ago, as I realized that at that point I was ten years into the business with working with clients and. 
you know, I came into this business like a lot of us do really with the numerical data. I had to know all these numbers, these, these equations, how to, how to invest and all these things. Right. And what I found after about 10 years of doing it was a lot of clients worries and a lot of our worries as humans really had a little bit less to do with the qual the quantitative data. It had a lot more to do with the qualitative. And this is like the, the interest, the goals, the relationships, the values we all carry and money we all know is just a tool, right? It is not the thing. It is just something that we use to do the things we want to do. And so what's interesting about a couple of years ago, in fact, the book Psychology of Money um, was written by a guy named Morgan Housel, and I absolutely fell in love with it. Um, so it's interesting we're even titling that because I don't know if you've read that book before, Brett, but it's an amazing book. I would recommend it for anybody and everybody. I've read it multiple times. Um, and it's just a great example of there's plenty of studies on psychology and money. This goes back way back. I have plenty of books behind me on the psychology of money. But that one was so cool because it laid it out. He wrote it so well, in my opinion, with anecdotal evidence, stories and just different things. And I think the number one thing that most people get wrong about money is that they actually think it has some metric in our life to do the things we want to do. And I, I've seen it time and time again with clients that if they obtain that theory or whatever that money is, that monetary goal there is, which again, is a great thing. We always tend to like move the goalposts and we do that in our, our life as well. And I think it's important in financial advising that we talk about that and just kind of, we, we start here at One Capital Management with a conversation of what's your why with a client. And, and we, we do that simply because when someone comes in and meets with us, we want to understand who they are, you know, and, and, and it's, and again, it's less questions or, 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 you know, items we need to gather around the numbers, their income, their debts, their assets. Those are important. But we're also trying to figure out who, what their behavioral financial like DNA is. Like they've all, they've come into our office, they've met with us via Zoom and they have a history. They, they've, they're coming in here from somewhere. You know, I just said, Brett, I had the other day, I had a, a great example within a week span of a review meeting with clients. I had one client who very clearly shared with me that you know, he wants to spend every dollar he can when he can. He's totally living the the live for now moment, right? Because his parents had saved, saved, saved. And then like seven months after he retired, his dad passed away unexpectedly. Mom went two years later. So his view of money was very much like, I want to spend it. I, I understand saving, investing, but I want to spend it. And the literally the week later, I was having a review with a client. We were talking about estate planning and legacy planning conversations. And through that discovery with the new, it was a newer client we were realizing that their parents were 97 and 99 years old and in full health. So in their mind, they were so focused on longevity. And so it was just a great example of two polar you know, opposites when you talk about planning. And it's a great example and a story to share that we're all different. And I think the way we treat money needs to be different as well. And so that enters into the psychology of how we individually perceive money, what it means to us, what we want from it, and ultimately we want to end up kind of the one thing we all know we want is time. You know, it's the one commodity in life we can't get back. I speak about it often. Uh, my one parlor trick is I can tell someone I can I can prove to you that you care about time more than money. Because if a 95 year old today came to you and said, hey, man, I'll trade you places. I'll give you $10 billion and I'll trade you places permanently. And I would ask someone, would you do that? The answer would likely be no. If you're 60 years old and you answer that question, you would lose 35 years of your life. Time matters more. And so understanding your why understanding how where your not just psychology in general by the way there's plenty of studies on that but your psychology and i think a good advisor can ask the right questions get into the mindset help you understand your goals and objectives with money because most clients come in they're not totally entirely sure right so we want to help them get to that point by asking the right questions understanding who they are meeting with them kneecap to kneecap empathizing with them understanding their story because everyone has a financial story some people grew up you know, on food stamps, some people grew up on Silver Spoon. We want to understand there's two different walks of life out there, many different walks of life, frankly. So I think the psychology money plays into the right questions being asked in an introductory meeting with an advisor. And then ultimately, how you would then prepare a financial plan or overall invest your overall portfolio. It also plays Got into it. things like taxes and all the other mm -hmm. items that we go through. Yeah, we'll dive into that. So that's amazing. What are the first secret to start out with? And it's, it's really about what's your why, right? So if you're listening to this, what is your why? Have you defined your why? Have you written down your why? Have you been reminded of your why? Are you thinking about your why? You're setting goals behind your why? And are you planning to achieve your why? And if you don't, if you haven't defined that or, or, or reviewed that, it's not just the, it's not just the, uh, um, uh, the, the quantitative, right? The numbers, right? It's the qualitative. It's the interest, the goals, the values. Uh, money is a tool. And really, what's your behavioral money DNA? Is that a fair summary, Mr. Brad Barrett? Yeah. Yeah, I like it.
Excellent. What would you say the number two secret is to the psychology of money? I think time value. I, I mentioned time earlier, but I was mentioning kind of like your why, but I'd also say, you know, what does time mean to you? You know, like we all have heard the statement before, right? You know, um, uh, you're working for your money. At some point, you want your money to work for you, right? And so it's interesting because I, I, I in fact, right after this, Brett, I have a client meeting who's retiring in three months. And we're going to have a conversation. I was having a conversation with him last week. We're preparing it with him and his wife today. And, you know, we're having this discussion on psychology about time because his mindset has been for 30 years into growing, investing and saving, contributing and knowing if he took his family on a vacation or something like that, that, OK, he can go work overtime or go build something different and like make more money that way. Now it becomes an idea of he's worked for his money. And now we're kind of having the conversation of now the money needs to work for you because he has plenty of it. And so I'm sharing that with him, but I'm also sharing it with him, not just from me just saying it and him trusting me, but I'm also showing him through what we call our wealth forecast or a financial plan, understanding your distribution number. Lately, this, this has been come around the fire, the financial independence number, those kind of things. Showing what your sustainable distribution rate is ultimately shows you your time because ultimately we're saving and investing to spend our time how we want to do it. We're willing to give up some time, invest in ourselves, save for ourselves, ultimately to use it for ourselves. And so really when I talk about time and the, the second thing, which is a good question here, Brett, is, you know, is around what people like, it, it, it's how time matters to you, right? And I think it's, it can be different. So if you're listening and watching here, it's okay if your time is, you know, I like work. That's what I want to do. I want to do it till I can't. That's great. I have some people that want to retire when they're 40 years old. That's also great, right? But it's meeting, making sure that time works for them and how they want to construct it and ultimately how they want to use it. And so money and investing, saving on taxes, uh, you know, saving when posthumously in an estate planning case or anything else like that is ultimately not necessarily about saving money, but also about buying time, buying time for you or ultimately buying time for your heirs or anyone else in your family that you're trying to care for. Absolutely. That's so good. I love the way you put that. Uh, what does time mean for you? Uh, what's your financial independence uh, number? Um, and I think it's, like you said, it sounds like it's a change of mindset from, hey, I've been working for money to save and invest. Now it's changing and shifting to a mindset of now this money is going to work and uh, and save me time and energy, right? To be able to yeah. do the things that I want to be doing and or working more if you want to work more. Maybe that new entrepreneurial journey or whatever that yeah. might be, that passion that you have. Uh, starting that restaurant or starting that, that tech company or you know buying that piece of real estate and doing some kind of project. And so that I think is fantastic. And so how does time matter to you? By the way, we're talking with Brad Barrett. He's a certified financial planner. You can find him on his YouTube channel, Make Your Money Matter. Let's lead into question number three or, or secret number three. Uh, Brad, what would you say the number three secret is to the psychology of money? I think... When you talk about what's your why with money, you ultimately talk about your time. Then I think at some point when it comes to the psychology of money is what are you doing it for? And ultimately not even what, who are you doing it for? I use this a lot with clients and I talk about um, the airplane analogy, right? We've all been there, especially if you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about. You're boarding a flight and they're going through the whole safety checks and everything like that. And they say, okay, look, if we lose oxygen, right? and the mask comes from, from the top, make sure to put your oxygen mask on first before your children. Now, it seems crazy because it's just like one of those things like, why would I do that? My first instinct will be immediately to help them. The reality is we all know we can't help them if we're passed out. You cannot help someone you care for or love if you're broke. You cannot help someone you care for or you love if you have not financially dialed in your situation. So when you talk about what's your why and you refine that ultimately to buy you the most important commodity there is, which is time, and then you ultimately get into who are you doing it for? And by the way, it could be yourself as well because you deserve some of this, right? I think a lot of us, I say this a lot on our show, we talk about this time philosophy and what money means for us. But, you know, bro, when I, when I go into these kind of three things here, when we talk about, you know, and we, if we really break it down, we tend to spend our youth or our younger years, if you will, sacrificing our health for our wealth. And then ultimately at some point it switches, maybe it's your fifties or sixties or seventies, where we then sacrifice our wealth for our health. And I think one of the things I really want to share out there and being a financial advisor nearly 20 years and, and still young in the game, in my mind, at least energy wise, you know, is really making sure that we have a happy medium and a balance because the who in this third scenario, right, might be you. And we don't want to be too dilapidated or whatever. We spent all of our years, all of our time, all of our energy, all of our stress focusing on something 
We want to enjoy it ourselves as well. So when you define who that is, and it could be your spouse, your kids, your grandkids, uh, it could be a legacy you want to leave with a church, uh, with a charity, with a nonprofit organization. I mean, there's so many great whys out there ultimately that lead into who. And I think when you kind of put all those things together, you get a really good mixture of what money actually means to you and not money in the sense of like, like I say this a lot, like comparison to the thief of joy, right? So I don't want anybody looking over the fence and be like, oh, Bob next door just got a new grill. And we think immediately, like that's how marketing in the world works. Now, definitely how money gets into our soul. And I talked a lot about with those clients, right? And again, it's a tool. It is not the tool. It is just a tool to get you access to other things that you want. And it's defining your why, ultimately getting the time that you want out of it. And then for who it might be for, whether it's you or for a family or whoever who you're trying to care for. Amazing. Brad Barrett, uh, it's secret number three. Who are you doing it for? For yourself, for your family member, for the impact that you want to make. And I love that analogy of the oxygen mask, right? Making sure you're, you're putting on yourself because if you're broke, right? If you don't have a plan, if you don't have a clear purpose with your money, it's going to be very hard to help someone else out. So make sure that you're, 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 you're getting yourself um, uh, well prepared in an order. And I also like the way you put, we tend to spend our younger years sacrificing our health for our wealth and our later years sacrificing our wealth for our health. And so be careful not to get too much out of balance. We talked about the three secrets here. Um, number one, again, was uh, what does, what, uh, uh, you know, being being qualitative, right? Being qualitative, what's your why? Number two, what is the one thing that, what does time mean to you? Number three, who are you doing it for? You can learn more about Brad Barrett by going to his YouTube channel, Make Your Money Matter. We're going to transition into some capital gains, tax deferral uh, solutions and strategies if you're, if you're ready for that, Brad. So I, I, I'm just start with this question. I'm curious, how would you define an effective capital gains tax exit plan as it pertains to the psychology of money? You know, I actually was looking forward to this when I when you invited me on your show. I appreciate it. I've listened to a lot of your stuff and I love what you're doing. Um, I, I'd answer it this way, Brett, and I'm really actually curious your thoughts as well as kind of an open discussion. And this is coming from a financial advisor, and I share this a lot because I obviously work with a lot of CPAs, a lot of tax attorneys, enrolled agents with our clients. To answer that question to me, the word that comes up is, is perception, and perception is reality. And, and I share it this way, right? My grandfather once told me, he goes, don't trip over dollars to save pennies. And I, as a kid, I was like, I don't really, you know, didn't really register with me. And I've used that analogy sometimes with clients in that whatever transaction you're looking at, whether it's real estate, um, uh, you know, an after-tax uh, holding or investment or whatever it might be. And obviously this depends on your tax bracket because if you're in a higher ordinary income tax bracket, capital gains will be obviously more, you know, incredible for you. Obviously, if you're around the same uh, ordinary income taxes, you are capital gains taxes, it might be different, which by the way is a great example of perception here. But the idea I'm trying to guess, get, I'm get at is, is I think a lot of it has to do with understanding back to my original number one, at least from me from a financial planning standpoint, right? Is what's your why? I mean, obviously we all want to keep more, <laughs> Than, than what we're giving away, especially to our federal government. There's no doubt about it, right? They call it gross tax for a reason. It's disgusting what we send up to them. So it's 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 important, I think, when we talk about perception, you know, that's how I'd kind of open that discussion, Brett, honestly. And obviously you're you're the captain in that chair and you obviously are very, very well versed in that. And I think when we design, uh, whether it's, you know, Roth conversions, Roth discussions with clients, we, des we design 1031 discussions, get the you know, accommodator inside of there with for, for our clients or whatever, whatever tax strategy it might be. I guess what I'm trying to share is we try to do it all relative to the client, because I definitely in our over 2000 clients that we serve, you know, we have uh, obviously we have varying different net worths. We also have very different backgrounds, which leads to my you know understanding who they are and then their perception of money. We have some clients that say, look, I understand I don't pay taxes, but l the liquidity to me means more than the illiquidity. So you can't argue that, right? They understand the tax rules and they know it's gonna go down. And as much as I'd love for them to defer it, right? Uh, they're like, look, the liquidity means more to me right now because I wanna do X, Y, or Z. So I'd rather do that than other things. And so for us as a planning side, we get to we get the easy chair, I think, in this scenario. You guys have the tough one of actually designing it, you know, but we, we get to kind of sit with them and, and sign and say, okay, what is your goal with your money? Which is always a good question, right? Uh, again, back to those three philosophies you should go into, right? And I think when you talk about taxes, particularly capital gains or an exit strategy as it relates to capital gains, it all has to do with the perception of the client and what their ultimate goal is. If they're okay paying the taxes, okay, great. Then it was obviously a successful transition or exit. If they're really tied up on not paying a single cent, then you're gonna have to go through every strategy known to man 
right, to be able to do it. And the best part about our country is, if, if you will, is we have a, a pretty open tax code with a lot of great strategies you can utilize. And I'm sure, you know, obviously that's something that's right into your wheelhouse. Absolutely, but I love the way you way you put that, and it's and I and I think that's the key here. Uh, and how to build an effective capital gains tax exit plan always starts with you, you the listener, you the investor, uh, you who have built that business, that real estate uh, invested in, you know, a home at a good time and held on it for a long time. That cryptocurrency, that stock, and what's effective for for one may not be as effective for the other. And defining if effective could mean liquidity, mm -hmm. of course, could mean diversification could mean not having to deal with landlords or not, not having to deal with a, a government or a state like California, who's so restrictive on landlords, yeah. um, not having to deal with, you know, tenants, toilets, trash, termites, you know, moving out of that big house that you feel like, you know, your cash, your, your real estate rich, but maybe a little cash flow, flow light and be able to defer that capital gains tax. If people want to learn more about what options are available, and that's key because it's not just a one size fits all, there's multiple options. You can go to capitalgainstaxsolutions.com where we can help you uh, navigate uh, different strategies as it pertains to the deferred sales trust in particular, but also Delaware statutory trust, opportunity zones, 1031 exchanges. Also get with Brad Barrett, um, who can also help you navigate it as well and compare and contrast notes, because guess what? Uh, it's good to get second opinions and to figure out what's the most effective way. And sometimes it's both. Sometimes it's that donor advised fund coupled with uh, the deferred sales trust. Sometimes it's that defer, deferred sales trust coupled with the 1031 exchange. It all just depends on what you're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. Go to capitalgainstaxsolutions.com. Brad, do you want to add anything to that? No, actually, I love it. That's that's totally how we would design it too. And I think understanding of the team you have in place matters, right? I've always told clients that a financial advisor, a good one, should be a quarterback to you, not the only team member, right? You got to have other people on the field, you know, and, and kind of run the ball down, down the field for you. So employing a lot of people, comparing notes, multiple strategies is very important. Excellent. And ready for the lightning round. Let's do it. All right, here we go. Knowing what you know now, Brad, if you could go back to your 25 year old self, what's the one golden nugget make sure to tell yourself to do? Never stop investing. And by the way, I know how that sounds coming from a financial advisor, but there's been multiple times in my life where I was like, oh, I'll peel back on my 401k contribution for this reason or whatever. And I would have said, if you look back at history and you understand dollar cost averaging, especially within a consistency of like every two weeks or biweekly, I don't care if it's a hundred dollars. It, 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 it's irrelevant. The amount, I mean, the amount obviously matters over time, but it's more the consistency. So I'd have been more consistent with myself when I was 25. Excellent. Question number two, uh, what's the number one book you've recommended or give to most in the past year? Oh, I mean, I already led with it. So I already answered this one. Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel, an incredible book. Excellent. I just downloaded it on my uh, Audible. So I'm going to listen to it hopefully this week. You'll, you'll um, love it, Brett. Honestly, it's one of those books like we read a lot of these kind of things. He's a He wrote this in one of the most exceptional ways I've ever seen. So it's, it's a great book. Fantastic. All right, next question. What are you most curious about right now? Um, that's a good question. I think what I'm most curious about if, if I look at, you know, the, that's actually kind of in your wheelhouse and tax codes, right? I'm just very curious how we're going to start seeing these, these, um, the, the sunset coming up here in 25 and just how that's all going to play out. Obviously it has a lot to do with some of our clients and their longer term planning. Uh, and I'm meaning the Trump tax cuts here that are sun, uh, set to sunset here in 25, because obviously as it stands right now, it's going to revert back to almost the Bush era tax cuts. And so Curious about reform in that regard and, and just how it's going to look for our clients long term. Yeah, absolutely. And real quick for people who don't know uh, what we're referring to, in 2026, basically, the beginning of that, mm -hmm. you're going to have estate tax exemptions cutting in half, which means 24 million married is going to about 12 million single and about 12 to you know, 14 million singles to about six to, to six to seven. Unless they change something, it could change something, but that's something to consider. Everything above and beyond that is subject to a 40% death tax, not eligible for the stepped up basis. I mean, you still get the stepped up basis, but you know, your state tax is not is, is, is something separate from that, mm -hmm. as well as cap gains tax will probably go higher as well. There's a lot of challenges out there. So just be prepared for what's going on. Uh, last question, Brad, after all your success, helping all the people you've helped, what's the number one way you stay centered in your values and stay encouraged to charge for to reach new heights? Uh, for me, if it's okay sharing, it's God. I'm very involved with in my church. Uh, my wife uh, and I were saved. And um, it's one of those things that keeps us centered, grounded. And um, I share people with this often. It's, it's, you know, God, family, work. And I think if you keep it in that order, you find that you're actually serving the people better when you have that order in my life. So that's that's what keeps me centered and going. Amen, Brad. I can't uh, appreciate you sharing that. And uh, and likewise, um, that's the order that uh, I strive for every single day as well. For our listeners who want to get in touch with you, Brad, uh, could you remind them one last time? And by the way, before we even go there, I want to thank you for being on the show, sharing a tremendous amount of wisdom here 
in just uh, 24 minutes or so. I want to encourage you to keep using your strength to connect with others and also to connect with them in a real way, to empathize with them in each of their unique circumstances, whether that be you know, uh, wealth, um, coming from wealth, not coming from a lot of wealth and basically mm. customizing solutions to help your clients create and preserve more wealth and ultimately unlock their freedom to make the impact with their wealth that they so want to make, uh, for people who want to get in touch with you, could you remind them one last time, what's the best place for them to find you? Yeah. Uh, well, again, Brett, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. And thank you all for watching and listening. Uh, you can find me at make your money matter with Brad Barrett on YouTube. We also have a corresponding podcast. Uh, that streams on any platform you'd otherwise down a podcast uh, just type in make your money matter with brad barrett you can also go to our website at onecapital.com you can find out about myself all of my partners our team members here you can also download and subscribe to the podcast and the youtube channel there as well amazing thank you brad barrett and i also want to thank our listeners for listening to another episode of the capital gains tax solutions podcast also stream on expert cre secrets podcast where we believe most high net worth individuals and those who help them they struggle with clarifying their capital gains tax for options not having a clear plan is the enemy and also not having a dream team to help you execute on that clean your plan is the enemy and using a proven tax referral strategy such as the deferred sales trust or getting with someone like brad barrett to plan out your wealth and exit plan is an amazing way for you to create and preserve more wealth take action today start planning start preparing start building your team if you want to uh connect with us you can go to capital gains tax thanks so much for listening or watching please rate review subscribe and we will talk to you